Welcome again to the preaching teaching ministry of Berean Bible Church here in Denver. We're located at 1400 Bird Street. Today I say the address because we will be hopefully in the future opening our church building back up for worship services. We plan to do that on the very first Sunday in June, which I believe is the 6th. So you're welcome to join us then as well. As you know, we're already working through the book of Galatians and we've worked our way up to chapter two. We have a pretty interesting sermon today. Um, if you have some confrontation you're thinking about or how do we do that the right way? Where does love come into it? And where does the truth come into it? When do you do it in public? When do you do it in private? You might get something out of today's lesson. So let's go ahead and open up with prayer so that you can get that from the Lord. Let's go ahead and pray over our message and get started. Father, we do thank you for this day. Thank you for all that you have given us already. Thank you for your many, many blessings in all of our lives. And so Father, as we come today and we get into Galatians chapter two, and we look at um, verses 11 through 14, we ask Father that your spirit would have his way as we deal with relationships, as we deal with confrontation, as we deal with the gospel, as we deal with the priorities that we should have and the proper perspective on things. We just ask that your Holy Spirit will use this in each of our lives in a very individual way. We pray, Father, that we would get a rhema word, a word specifically for us today in this area. So Father, please use this text for your glory and honor. And as always, we pray that, Lord, something will be said today that will draw us into more truth about you. And Father, will draw us into a deeper relationship with you. So we commit this time to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. What I'd like to do now is I'd like for us to just listen as I go through a few highlights, some of the things that we've already went through as we've looked at these first few chapters here in Galatians. It opened up with Paul um, defending his apostleship and he, he brought it out that he was sent from Christ and he was sent from God the Father. Then he went on to say that um, Christ gave himself for us, for our sins, to deliver us from this present evil age. And he focused on that there in verse four of chapter one. Then he got to the heart of the matter. He said, I'm amazed, I'm astonished that you, so have, you have so quickly deserted God. You deserted God, you deserted his grace, and you deserted his gospel. Then he told them the facts. You are listening to what he called gospel distorters, gospel distorters. And he said, you know what? A curse on anyone that brings another gospel than the one I brought to you. Then Paul brought out the fact that he's been seeking to please God, not men. And he said that the gospel that he preaches was given to him through the risen Christ by revelation. Paul then um, talked about how he used to be so heavily into what we call Judaism and that he was so much into it. He was so zealous in Judaism that he was actually persecuting the church or the people of God. Then Paul brought out how that God set him apart for service, and then God called him to salvation, and it was an effectual call, and that Paul said yes, and he started that relationship with God. He then started to share a little history after he started the relationship. He didn't go up to Jerusalem or to the 12 or anyone else to consult and get information and be taught or discipled. He actually went away into Arabia and some deserted areas, and he was taught and discipled there. Um, most likely by Jesus Christ himself. Then years later, he went up to Jerusalem and he visited Peter um, and spent about two weeks with him. And it was about three years later that he actually did that. Then he went back to the regions of Syria and Cilicia. He was still unknown by sight to the churches who were in Judea, but they were praising God and glorifying God for what God had did in the life of Paul. Then 14 years later, we begin chapter two, and he says that God led him to go back to Jerusalem and he asked him to take some company. He took Barnabas with him and he also took Titus. Barnabas was a Jew and Titus a Gentile. It was kind of a test case. Some things were going on where they were laying things on the Gentiles to do that involved circumcision, becoming a Jew, um, their dietary laws and those type of things. 
and he was taking Titus and he was going to share his gospel and what God was requiring of the Gentiles with everybody up there, but he did it privately with those who were what our Bible calls of high reputation or very influential, the leaders in the Jerusalem church. So he had a meeting before the meeting with them and shared this gospel that God had him sharing among the Gentiles. And then he had the meeting, as if we will say it this way, with the whole conference. And so he did that. He shared the gospel that he's sharing both privately and publicly. Then as we continue on with that, he, um, the test case was passed in that Titus was able to just be Titus and continue on to do what he did. He didn't have to be circumcised. He didn't have to become a Jew. He didn't have to change his diet or anything like that. And so it was a success in a sense that everybody up there, especially the leaders there of the Jerusalem church recognized that God was using Paul in a very special way, recognized the gospel that he was preaching and recognized the things that were going to be different in their dealings with Gentiles as compared to the Jews. They did have a little trouble, but the bottom line is they had some people who came in, they were secretly brought in, they were trying to disrupt and put them, uh, the Gentiles under the law, do all the things that Paul was against, but they were not successful. Paul says, we didn't listen to them for even an hour, even a moment for this reason, because we have to be clear about the gospel. We have to be clear about what it takes to be saved. We have to be clear what God is, excuse me, about what God is requiring of Gentiles who come into relationship with, with him. And so he said, I had to make sure it was clear for your sake. And we brought out for our sakes today, because we're dealing with that same gospel, the gospel of the grace of God. So that's basically what we um, went over so far. In the end there, the um, leaders of the Jerusalem church gave Paul and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. Hey, we're with you, we're all on the same team and let's divvy the work up. Hey, Paul, you go to the Gentiles and we will go to the Jews and um, let's all remember to um, not forget the poor. So that's basically some of the highlights of some of the things that we went over and I thank you for your patience. So now what I'd like to do before we move into our new material, I'd like for us to read that from the text. So we're going to be reading Galatians chapter 2, and we're going to read the first 14 verses, some of the things I've already said, but I always want you to hear it from the word of God and not just take my word for it, but see it in the text, hear it from the text itself. So let's go ahead and read Galatians chapter 2, the verse first, excuse me, 14 verses. Then after an interval of 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along also. It was because of a revelation that I went up and I submitted to them the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but I did so in private to those who were of reputation for fear that I might be running or had run in vain. But not even Titus, who was with me, though he was a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. But it was because of the false brethren secretly brought in who had sneaked in to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, in order to bring us into bondage. But we did not yield in subjection to them for even an hour, so that the truth of the gospel would remain with you. But from those who were of high reputation, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Well, those who were of high reputation contributed nothing to me. But on the contrary, seeing that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised, for he who effectually worked for Peter in his apostleship to the circumcised effectually worked for me also to the Gentiles. And recognizing the grace that had been given to me James and Cephas and John, who were reputed to be pillars, gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship, so that we might go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. They only ask us to remember the poor, the very thing I also was eager to do. Here's our new scriptures. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For prior to the coming of certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision. The rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy with the result 
that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in the presence of all, if you being a Jew live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? Our sermon today, very simple. It's entitled, The Confrontation, The Confrontation. So we go back now to verse 11 and let's go ahead and read it and dig in. It says this, but when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. Now, as we get into this, the first thing that we see in verse 11 is that Cephas is now in Antioch. If you remember, this particular Antioch is the place where there was a lot going on, especially among Gentiles. There were a lot more Gentile believers there. And so early on, they started having some good activity there. God, the Holy Spirit was doing some good and mighty things. And so what they did is they sent Barnabas down there to check things out. And so as he looked at it, he said, hey, I wanna encourage you all to continue on in the grace of God. God is doing some great things here. I know somebody that needs to get over here and do some things because God has gifted them. God has endorsed this particular man. God has uh, done whatever is needed and he's the best guy for the job. And so what Barnabas did is he got on the next boat and he went to Tarsus and he found Paul or Saul and he brought him back and they stayed there in Antioch and both of them taught for about a year. Things started to flourish. God, the Holy Spirit was using them in a big time way. So they have this big Gentile, predominantly Gentile church there in Antioch. And so later on, this will be the place, Antioch, where believers are first called Christians. And so this is a good work that they are doing. So they've got that thing going on and a lot of history is, is went on, they've come and left. But as we get into this, I want you to remember what Paul is doing. He's giving a history lesson. He's taking these people from Galatia back down memory lane and giving a history and I, again, um, defending himself, defending what he's done, defending his apostleship, defending his message. And so as he does this, he says, okay, let's go back down. Let me tell you what happened. So now Peter, and Peter's a big shot. He's one of the big three that were mentioned in the previous verses, okay? He comes down to Antioch and he's coming for a little time to visit. And when he gets there, Paul says, I had to oppose him. I had to confront him. I had to call him out. It's saying there in verse 11, and I had to do it to his face, okay? Where everybody could see it. I had to do it to his face and I had to do it publicly. And he gives the reason why, because he was condemned because he was condemned. He had did something wrong. He was guilty. He was to blame. And this thing that he did was big and we couldn't let it slide, okay? We couldn't let it slide. So as we get into verse 12, we continue to go on. And now what he's doing, Paul is saying, okay, I told you what happened. I had to confront him. And now he's saying, let me tell you why I had to confront Peter. Verse 12 says this, for prior to the coming of certain men from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision. Here's what happened. He's flashing it back. And he says, okay, when he got here, this is what he did. Before these people came from James, before these people arrived from Jerusalem, before these people came from the, we'll call it the Jewish church there in Jerusalem, here's what was happening. We would all be eating together, okay? Jews and Gentiles, having good meals together. We were all eating different foods together, okay? We were enjoying different foods. There weren't any restrictions there. I may be able to exaggerate to make a point. Peter may have even been eating some pork, okay? Lord, have mercy for a Jew to say that, okay? And so they have all these things going on, enjoying each other's company, hanging out together with each other. They were, um, again, there weren't the food restrictions. They were dipping in the same um, dips and eating, doing that type of thing. And so everything is going well. And so that's what was going on before these people from up in Jerusalem, before these people who were up under James came into town. And so that's what's going on. 
So then these guys from James show up. It was what verse 12 is telling us. Paul's flashing it back. And all of a sudden, Peter starts to change. Now, I forgot to tell you something. What we're talking about in this verse, when we're talking about him eating with the Gentiles and we're talking about him changing, it's in the imperfect tense. And what that means is this was something he was doing continually. This was something that he was doing all the time. We might even be able to say it was a habit, okay? It was something that he was repeating all the time. He was eating with the Gentiles, hanging out with the Gentiles. And then when these people showed up, he saw them and then he started to repeatedly do the same thing, but the opposite, staying away, drawing away, not sitting down with the Gentile brothers now. Um, now he's, uh, he doesn't want to eat any of that, um, that food that we've been eating all along. He's just going to be eating strictly a kosher diet right now. Everything changed, okay? And he started just really withdrawing. And what, was the, what does verse 12 say was the motive, the bottom line? He was afraid. He was afraid of what these people were going to think. He was afraid of what they were going to say. He was, going, he was afraid of what they might say about him, his reputation. He was given in to fear. The Proverbs say, and you know it, the fear of man is a snare. A fear of man is a trap for us. And here's what happened to him. He fell into a trap. So Paul is flashing this thing back. Number one, verse 11, I had to confront him. Here's where I, I had to confront him. This is how he was acting. So then we get into verse 13 as we continue on. Let me read that. It says this, the rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. As we get into this, we get into verse 13 and we're learning some lessons and we're gonna come back and grab some more of these lessons. But one of the lessons that we learn here is that Peter influenced them big time. He influenced them as a leader. As a leader, you have influence whether you want to face it or deal with it or accept it or not. As a leader, people are always watching you. Peter is a big time leader in the things of God. These other Jewish people started looking at what he was doing. And then what did they do? Verse 13 says they followed suit. They followed suit. There's a famous saying when I grew up, it was attributed to a, a football coach, Chuck Knox, okay? And then um, a long time ago, President Kennedy, he paraphrased it in one of his speeches, but that saying is, what you do speaks so loud, I can't hear what you say. What you do speaks so loud, I can't hear what you say. And the person who actually coined that phrase, his name was Ralph Waldo Emerson. And I believe if my memory serves me correctly, correctly, it was part of a sermon, okay? What you do speak so loud, I can't hear what you say. Peter has this influence as a leader, and then he has a visual influence. People watch us, people watch us, and they will um, make decisions based on what we do. And so it's very, very important. They watched what Peter did, and then they decided to do the very same thing. So all of a sudden, they didn't hang out around the Gentiles as much. All of a sudden, they didn't want to eat anything that might have had pork in it. All of a sudden, they were just really strict on their diet and who they hung out with. So Peter has really influenced them. And so let's walk back through some of these things here as we, we get into this. As we go into this, let's go into verse 11. I'm going to, you know, follow me now. I'm not going to confuse you, but let's start getting some of the, the real meat of this here. Sometimes as a Christian, as a person in general, we're going to have to call people out. We're going to have to call people out. And sometimes we're going to have to call them out to their face, okay? And so there will be times where the right thing to do is to call somebody on what they're doing or what they're not doing, or maybe even about what they're saying. Um, a lot of times we do some different things there. We, um, we can, you know, say we're going to talk about it, but we do it in a group. We don't go to the person who's done it. We go to the group and we might talk about the person. Then there's another thing that we sometimes do is we might even go to the person in private. And in most cases, that's usually the best thing to do. But sometimes when something happens that's done in public, there is a time and a place where we have to confront the person and call them out in public. Now, folks, we're going to get into this. 
What Peter is doing is major. It is big because what he's doing right now, and Paul's going to bring this out, is he's messing with the truth, the reality of the gospel. He's sending a message. He's sending a double message. He's communicating something that the gospel does not communicate. He's saying that, no, we really don't accept those people. Um, we don't really accept them up there. That's not what really what God is doing right now. Now, remember, we're in a transition, okay? We're in a transition, and he understands all of this. He was sent to Cornelius to get this thing started, where he was sent to a, a Gentile, and the Holy Spirit said to this to him, and you go check it. He said this to him, you go without asking questions, this thing is from me. He had to tell Peter that, and Peter went on. So Peter's had firsthand knowledge of what God is doing. There's a transition, but when he's down here, he's not doing that. Do you remember the movie um, 42, if you got to see that? There's been many of them, but I'm thinking the last one. And so in that movie 42, Jackie Robinson is on the baseball team and they're traveling all over the country. And so they go somewhere, if I remember correctly, it was down south. And the, the umpire, he basically said, uh-uh, you boys might do that up north, but we don't do that kind of stuff down here in the south. Get out of here. You're not playing baseball here. Now, crude illustration, but something similar to that is happening here. See, because before this thing was all over, they're going to play baseball and black people will be allowed to play baseball everywhere in the United States. But they were transitioning. They were getting there, but they weren't quite there yet. So the people in this particular place down south were like, oh, no, we don't do that. Y'all might do that up north, but we don't do that down here. And you're out of this game. Well, it's kind of similar. As we go back to where Peter was living, God is making some transitions here. God is saying that everybody, Gentile, Jew alike, doesn't matter where you come from, we're going to all start playing spiritual baseball. We're going to all start playing spiritual baseball together here. And so what is happening is the people up north, if we can say that, in Jerusalem, they're slow in the transition. They're not really getting it fully yet and not willing to work with it yet. Maybe they got it, but they weren't really willing to work with it. And so now they come down and they see Peter, that's where they come from, and then he reverts back to it. Just like the Jackie Robinson illustration, uh-uh, we don't do it like that where we're from. And then Peter went all the way back to that, and he shouldn't have. And so because it was done in public, and because it was done in front of everybody, because a leader did it in front of everybody in public, he needs to be confronted in public, in front of the people that he's influenced, and in the sphere in which he did it. So this is so important that it has to be corrected in the, the exact same circumstances in which it occurred. And so verse 11, we're bringing that out now that Paul had to do it that way. He had to do exactly that way because this thing is big. And why? Because it's about the truth of the gospel, even more specific and precise, what it takes to be saved, what it takes for a Gentile to be saved. And that's where we're transitioning right now. So it was so important. So Paul had to call him out in public. He didn't say, let me talk to you in private on this one. And he didn't say, let's have a prayer meeting about it. And he didn't do what sometimes we're guilty of doing, talking to somebody saying, let's pray about it when it's really gossip when what we should have did is went straight to the person in their face, whether it was a private thing or a public thing and dealt with it. So it's just giving us a little bit of understanding here. When it comes to truth in this thing called the Christian life, we have some in-house debates. We have some things that we talk about, a pre-trib rapture, a post-trib rapture. We talk about some different things in theology, you know, but there are some fundamentals of the faith that if someone is uh, messing with those, we need to deal with that immediately and even in public, um, wherever, wherever we need to deal with that, it's that serious. And so this is about the truth about how the Gentiles are to be saved. This is about the gospel of the grace of God. And Paul said, we can't mess this up. I've got to nail you here in public. It's not that I don't love you. It's not that I don't care. I've got to nail it. So then when we get into verse 12 again, that fear of man, you know, Paul talked about it here in Galatians 2.10, for do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? If I yet were seeking to please men, I should not be a servant of Christ. 
Well, in this particular instance, Peter's having a lapse. This isn't his whole uh, body of work, but in this particular thing, he gave in to peer pressure. Now, folks, we are in a culture now that it seems like everything that um, we hold dear is wrong or, or wrong is right and right is wrong. And, and we're feeling all these kinds of pressures and um, something to give into the culture. And folks, it's not only outside the church, it's inside the church as well. Give in to the culture. The culture is invading the church. And we can be like Peter if we're not careful. We can know the truth, but give in to those who are putting peer pressure on us, even people in the church. And that's what happened to him. The fear of man, but I want you to get this, the fear of other people who serve the same God he's serving, they're bringing this pressure. They're wrong. He's right, but he's giving in to the pressure. And so that is something that we really want to keep in mind. And again, as I mentioned, don't forget the whole thing. What you do speaks so loud, I can't hear what you say. People are going to go by what you do, not by what you say. We do a lot of talking, but the bottom line is, what do we do? And so as we get into that, we get back into the verse again, that even Barnabas in verse 13, he started doing the same thing. Why do they single him out? Okay, His name means son of encouragement. Barnabas is the guy who went and got this guy by the name of Saul and Tarsus, came, started this whole ministry. He went out with Paul on missionary journeys. He's been working with Paul the Gentiles. He knew better than anybody that that's not how this thing is supposed to work. That, hey, we're here together. The Gentiles don't have to do these things. He knew it better than anybody. But do you see the peer pressure? Another leader, another person doing instead of doing the wrong thing instead of the right thing. Are you a leader? Are you aware today of your influence as just having the position? Are you aware today that people are gonna watch what you do even more than what you say? As a leader, we have a high responsibility. A leader, James, the book of James, it talks about even teachers, you're gonna be judged by a higher standard. And so we need to really take our position and our responsibility seriously. Watch what you do. Everybody else is watching you. Those of you who've been under my ministry for years, please be patient because you've heard this so many times. The unsaved people have higher standards for Christians than Christians do. The unsaved people might make fun of you, talk about you, do everything under the sun, talk about your God and everything else, but they're watching what you do. They want somebody to stand, somebody to still be standing up when this thing is all over, and they have higher standards for you than even Christians do. You can give in. You can talk about your rights. You can talk about your freedom in Christ. God says, be careful with all of that. The unsaved have higher standards for Christians than Christians do sometimes. And so those are some of the things that we grab out of this as we're getting into this. Let's talk about hypocrisy. Be patient with me. Hypocrisy is showing on the outside something different than you are on the inside. Okay, hypocrisy. I am living out, I am doing, I am showing something different than who I really am on the inside. So the Bible calls us hypocrites when we are not really living out or letting what's inside of us, and here's it, here it is, who we are in Christ come out on the outside, come out on the in outside. And so the culture, people walking after the flesh, those type of things, they can influence us to keep what's really on the inside of us that's right, Christ and his life, keep it inside. Don't let it out. Do something different so you communicate something different. And that's what the enemy wants us to do. Always communicate a lie. Don't communicate the truth. And so hypocrisy, again, um, letting that, that action, letting those, uh, what I do, be something other than what I really am or who I really am or whose I really am on the inside. And then you got to have this one. We have to throw this one in. Most of us have been trained this way, especially if we are very emotional people. Hypocrisy is defined as going against my feelings. I ain't going up to that church. Why? Why? Because I don't like those people. 
because I don't like them. I don't feel good about them. I don't feel a good feeling toward them. I would be a hypocrite if I go up there when I'm feeling this way. That is not the true definition of hypocrisy, but that is most of our definition. Don't go against your feelings. If you're going against your feelings, you're a hypocrite. Well, brother and sister, let me tell you something right now that you already know. You're not always going to feel like doing anything. You're not always going to feel like loving someone. You're not always going to feel like going that extra mile, but go ahead and do what God wants you to do anyway, in spite of your feelings. Most of us need to go ahead and grow up and quit living our lives 100% by our feelings is killing us. We need to live our lives by faith. What has God's word said regardless of my feelings? And I want to be who I am really on the inside. Let God flow out no matter how I feel. That's our definition of hypocrisy. Don't go against your feelings. And that's why some of us are so unforgiving and bitter and why our lives are so messed up. No, no, do it God's way, do what he says. Don't be this person that defines hypocrisy as going against your feelings. It's killed a whole lot of people already. Don't let it kill you, okay? So these are just some of the things as we get into our text that we can bring out. Barnabas is carried away by their hypocrisy. Shame, shame, shame on Barnabas. He definitely knew better. Another lesson to hear that we need to learn Mm -mm. The scripture says this way, those of you who think you stand, take heed lest you fall. You've heard that, right? You've heard that over there in 1 Corinthians, right? So here's a lesson we need to learn. Anybody can do the wrong thing. Anybody can give in to peer pressure. Anybody can start acting the wrong way. Anybody can reject somebody based on the color of their skin or the food they eat or the culture that they bring. Anybody can be guilty of doing what these fine men of God have done. Amen? Anybody, and that includes me and that includes you. We need to take heed lest we fall. Walk humbly with your God, love justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. Oh yes. It can happen to you. We can be calling your name out tomorrow. We can be calling my name out tomorrow. I was telling our trustee just yesterday, you know, some of the things we're going to have to do as we get our building um, fired back up and start meeting in our building again is we may have to have some registration. You know, you may have to remember to register um, to come to church. Hey, I'm put me on the list. I'm coming. And so we were talking about that and said, okay, now, we know we want to have some flexibility, of course, but some people who don't um, remember to sign up to get on the registry, we might have to turn them away. We might have to say, you can't come in. We've got our social distancing or whatever, and we're up to the limit now. You can't come in. So I was telling the trustee as I was talking about it, I said, yeah, let me hush. And let me walk humbly with my God. I said, because you know what will probably happen? We get to harping too much upon that. And you know who's going to probably forget to register to come in? Me. And we both got a good laugh at that. No, we need to take heed lest we fall. We're all capable of doing anything. These great men of God, following a great man of God, Peter. Wouldn't you want to have Peter's life, his overall body of work? Oh, I would love to. He blew it. He gave in. He had a downer, as some people would say. And he took some people down with him. Barnabas even. Oh, it can happen to anybody. Don't think too high of yourself. Romans chapter 12 says, Think soberly, justly, think in reality or truth. So let's close out with verse 14 today. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in the presence of all, if you being a Jew live like Gentiles and not like the Jews, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? So as we get into verse 14, Paul observed them. Paul studied them, okay? He watched them. He saw what they were doing, okay? Remember, they were repeatedly doing it, continually doing it, habitually. He looked. He didn't go and just, oh, make one glance and, oh, man, and come to a conclusion and go off on everybody. He studied them, okay? He studied them. And he says, I came to a conclusion. They're not being straightforward about the gospel. They're not in step with the gospel. And here's the big one. They are not lining up with the truth, the aletheia of the gospel. And that is very, 
very important. It's worth calling somebody out for. It's worth fighting for. They're not standing up here. They're not being straight about the truth of the gospel. And that's when he said, let me confront Cephas in front of everybody. So verse 14 says, you know what? I've checked you out. Here's my conclusion. You live your life like a Gentile. So you've been enjoying some things here that Gentiles bring to the table all along. So now how, question form, are you going to tell the Gentiles now and try to influence them to live like Jews now when you're not even doing that yourself? Oh, when you're not even doing that yourself. There's a pastor by the name of Steve Blackwell, Blackwell that taught me something. He was a, he's a pastor and he was my teacher in some of the training that I have had. And he also would remind me of things. And sometimes he'd say, Ron, sometimes you have to watch out. You have to watch out for these people who protest too much, who protest too much. And what he meant was this. Sometimes some of us are protesting. We got all this lip and all this loud and all this drama and all this trauma and all this emotion. And it's because we're not right. The very same things we're talking about, we're either doing you know, or we're saying don't do them and we're doing them, or we're talking about things we do and behind closed doors, we're really not living it out. We protest too much. And Paul is saying something very similar. Your life, Peter, protests too much to a certain extent. You're living like a Gentile and now you're over here protesting when, you know, that they should be living like Jews and want to get on somebody for not living like a Jew when you're doing the very same thing yourself. And I hate to say it, I'm a pastor. I try not to do anything to talk negatively about pastors, but it's the same is true for pastors. You ever run into a pastor that is so hard on something and talks about it and nails it and that's all this conversation is about. And then you read them, excuse me, read the newspaper and there they are, you see them on nine news doing the very same thing. They were such, uh, so vehement about, so emotional, protesting too much. And so Peter's um, getting called out by Paul. How can you, who live like a Gentile, call these Gentiles to live like Jews? You're living as a hypocrite here. You're living a life that's not true right now. It wasn't his all, all of his body of work. He learned and he grew here as well. May we learn from that. May we really keep it all in the right perspective. I hope today you've learned something about this whole thing of confrontation. In closing, I want to say this, that over in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25, it tells us to speak the truth in love. We are called as God's people to speak the truth in love. And there is all kinds of havoc, all kinds of pain, all kinds of delusion in the church, the body of Christ, because the church, the body of Christ is not being the church, the body of Christ, when it comes to speaking the truth in love. Many of us are legends in our own minds because no one's ever told us the truth. And God has called us out. We are to speak the truth to each other in love. Ephesians 4.25, and it's quoting Zechariah 8.16 in our Old Testament. So it's all throughout scripture. God wants us to speak the truth to each other in love. And if we did more of that, spirit-filled, spirit-led, speaking the truth in love, the whole body of Christ would be better because there would be a lot more healing in our lives. So I want to encourage you and I want to encourage me, spirit-filled, spirit-led, let's endeavor to speak the truth in love. There's a way to do it. It's not the same every time. This is a particular special case here. The truth of the gospel is at stake. But let's endeavor and let's talk to God about it. Lord, may I speak the truth in love and may I receive those who are speaking the truth in love to me. And my final words today, I want to leave you with this. Every week we, we give the gospel. Some of us know the gospel so well. Um, it's amazing. And we're not even saved. We don't even have a relationship, but we know the gospel. And I'm starting to learn something. I had a man who influenced me and a pastor and I won't even say his name, but he said something that's really stuck with me and I hope it will stick with you. You might be hearing the gospel again today. You've heard it so many times, you can quote it anytime. But I also wanna challenge you to make sure that you do this. 
make sure that you're wiping off the face of God, anybody else that you have in his place. Maybe you need to wipe your father's face off of the face of God. Maybe you need to wipe your mother's face off of the face of God. Maybe it's some things that have happened to you, some circumstances, some different things that are really hindering you from responding to God, from responding to his gospel, responding to him through the gospel. Remember in chapter one, they turned away from God to another gospel. And so I want to challenge you today. Maybe your word for the day is wipe these other people's face off the face of God and see God as he really is and receive him, get into this relationship through believing the gospel. That's part of what this thing is all about. Over there in chapter one, verse four, I believe it was, he said that Jesus Christ came to deliver us out of this evil age. And what it meant is to, to deliver us from all the things that are hindering us from coming to God in relationship, from hindering us from going on with God in relationship, from hindering us from being all that God really wants us to be. And one of those things is maybe we're looking at God through the face of someone else. I want to challenge you, um, please wipe those faces. Ask God to show you whose face you need to wipe off of his face so you can really go on. And for some of you, receive Christ as your personal savior through believing the gospel as we have been studying the gospel of the grace of God, Acts 20, 24, and the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4 that Jesus Christ died and was buried and rose again for your sins, making you savable. And you need to make a choice. Are you gonna be saved or not? I just wanna encourage you. Is someone else hindering you? Wipe their face away. You go on and get yours. Get in relationship with God. Let me close in prayer. Father, thank you for our time together. Confrontation, Lord. I pray that you will give us wisdom and that again, we'd be spirit-filled, spirit-led when you call us to confront someone. It's not always the same. One size doesn't fit all. There are times where we have to do it where the offense occurred. There's times where we have to do it in private. There are other times, but give us wisdom to know when to do it, but grant us, Father, to be willing to do it when we're supposed to. Father, forgive us. We give in to peer pressure. We're giving into the culture. We're giving into the church culture. We're giving into the culture coming into the church. There's a lot that happens, Lord. So we are praying that you will ring the bell and show us, Father, that we're trying to be men pleasers instead of God pleasers. And we're in a snare because we're afraid of men. And Father, please help us to know that no matter how long we've been walking with you, no matter what our position, no matter what our name, no matter where we're from, we're capable of doing these very same things. We're capable of denying the gospel. We're capable of denying you. And I pray, Father, that you will just help us to, as you said, take heed lest you fall. Keep a right view of who we really are. And Father, um, leaders, we've talked about that. All of us are, are capable. And I pray again for the leaders today, especially, that we would really stand and we realize, Lord, that people watch what we do as well as what we say. But Lord, it's not just leaders. You call all Christians out to that same thing. And Father, um, we just pray that we will stand where we need to, when it's about truth of the gospel, may we really get it settled in our souls. How are we saved? And stand for that, Father, and be flexible on those things that are non-essential, but um, really stand there and um, do what we need to when it comes to the essentials. And Father, we pray about this whole piece of hypocrisy. May we truly allow you to live your life out through us, that what is coming from inside of us is you, and we're not changing it and making it look like something or someone else. And please deliver those of us who are caught in that trap, that hypocrisy is going against our feelings and um, you don't go against your feelings, so you stay stuck. I pray that you'll really work with us there as well. And Father, when we protest too much, please ring a bell. Some of us are talking and protesting too much because secretly the very things we're protesting, we are practicing and they are in our lives. So God, help us to be honest with you and with others and with ourselves about these things. And Father, in closing in prayer, where we need to wipe other people's face off of your face and really deal with you, I pray that you'll show us and show us how to do that, Father. Um, why do we continue to not be saved? Why do we continue to not go on with you? Um, some of it is, Lord, we're looking at you through um, legalism. We're looking at you through different gospels. We're looking at you at um, Christians 
who were hypocritical, who were protesting too much, and we stop there. So Father, may we not stop there, but wipe their face off of your face and come into relationship with you. Thank you for this time together. We ask these things in the name of your son. Thank you for the privilege of having a relationship with you. In his name we pray, amen. You have a great week. And as I always say, good Lord willing, we'll see you next week. Take care. <laughs>